Hello everyone. Today we will be covering the unification of Germany in the 19th century. Now I've been looking forward to this lecture for a while, as my speciality is in modern German history, and unification in 1871 is often seen as the starting point in this regard. As usual for this course, our story begins with Napoleon. The German states had all performed poorly in the early years of the Napoleonic Wars. Austria and Prussia had been the first two major powers to declare war on revolutionary France, and both suffered a series of humiliating defeats to Napoleon's forces. The French treated the Germans poorly. Emperor Napoleon incorporated the western German lands which lay on the left bank of the River Rhine, including the large and iconic city of Cologne, into France itself. The French also set up a number of puppet states out of the small German kingdoms not part of Prussia or Austria, the most famous of which was the Confederation of the Rhine. Chastened by the defeats, both Prussia and Austria set about reorganising their armies, a process which, as with the Ottoman reforms, involved reforming aspects of the economy and of society as well. The reforms worked and both Prussia and Austria entered Paris in 1814, before the Prussians played a vital part in defeating Napoleon at Waterloo a year later. The war against Prussia had nonetheless fundamentally changed the country. The brief loss of Berlin, the guerrilla war of resistance waged in the forests, and the monarchy's triumphant return stimulated not only Prussian pride, but a wider German nationalism and a hatred of France. The newfound patriotism was symbolised by the awarding of the first Iron Crosses, a military award that could be earned by Germans of all ranks, not just the nobility. The Iron Cross was notable for being made out of a simple, harsh metal, unvarnished and plain. Indeed, it became fashionable at the Prussian court for all ranking aristocrats to take away their jewellery and present themselves as plainly as possible to show their humble virtue and their dedication to Prussia and to the Prussian people. This was the beginning of a reputation of Prussians as supposedly being more virtuous and moral than the materialistic West and the ostentation, ost ostentatiously sorry, Catholic South. Prussia gained lands in the west of Germany at the 1815 Congress of Vienna so that it could better guard against any future French invasion. However, the strongest power in Germany remained Austria and the ruling Habsburg family. As Napoleon had destroyed the earlier Home Holy Roman Empire, a successor organisation, the German Confederation, was founded as a way of ensuring continued Austrian supremacy in the country. The Confederation was not a unified state in any regard, and was hated by German nationalists who wanted a single strong German nation. It is best to think of it more as a military or security alliance where Austria and Prussia could protect the smaller German states whilst competing with each other to win their favour. As with Italy, German nationalism did not only continue to exist after 1815, but flourished, partly thanks to its alliance and association with political liberalism. Also like Italian nationalism, German nationalism was influenced by the ongoing Romantic movement and culture, and saw national unification as a way of somehow bringing to life the desires of the German people and the enrichment of their personal lives. Self-fulfilment was linked to national fulfilment by a number of writers and poets, such as Ernst Moritz Arndt, whose work were especially popular amongst students. In March 1819, a liberal student and member of a nationalist fraternity, Karl Ludwig Sand, murdered a conservative writer. What followed was a mass crackdown by the German Confederation of all liberal and German nationalist fraternities and university professors, as well as vastly increased newspaper censorship throughout all the German lands. Sand, beheaded in 1820, became a martyr for the nationalist cause. German nationalism, heavily repressed, found a space to thrive in the most unlikely of places, an economic customs union, the Zollverein. 
As independent entities, the German states were each free to set their own tariffs on goods moving in and out of their lands, a process that inhibited trade and stifled economic development. From 1818 onwards, Prussia began dismantling its own tariff barriers and inviting other German states to do the same. Prussian motivations have been described as economic or political, but were most likely both. By 1815, most German states had joined this customs union, uniting them together economically. The German nationalist, Friedrich List, played an important part in advocating the union, in advancing the union from a nationalist standpoint. List argued that a strong protective tariff was needed to shelter German industry from British manufacturers and warned that German states risked becoming economic colonies of Great Britain. As a result, as the German states cooperated internally with one another, their customs union maintained high walls to prevent non-Germans from interfering with German commerce. Nowhere was the drama of the 1848 uprisings more acute than in Germany. Liberals and nationalists from every German state descended on the central German city of Frankfurt, forming a national parliament. These men then proceeded to spend over a year debating a number of issues regarding what their new German state would look like without actually having won control of the country at all. Nonetheless, the debates and the decisions of the parliament did foreshadow later developments in German history. One of the more significant debates was whether or not Austria should be included in the new German state, and, if it was to be included, whether the large Habsburg holdings in Hungary and Poland should be included as well. Bitter disputes along religious lines broke out, with centuries of religious conflict in Germany between North and South not being forgotten. One dark decision taken by the Frankfurt Parliament was the near-unanimous rejection of the Polish uprising, which precipitated a break between German and Polish nationalism, which had previously shared bonds of unity. Many German liberals considered the Poles to be backwards, emotional, and incapable of self-rule, justifying Prussian imperialism in that country. In Prussia itself, King Friedrich Wilhelm IV was so spooked by early protests that at one point he even joined the protesters. Despite being a deeply conservative man, he granted the Liberals a constitution and a parliament. Voting was weighted to ensure that the wealthiest Prussians and the great noble landowners, the Junkers, would be overrepresented in parliament. With the revolutionary forces faltering, Friedrich Wilhelm then turned against the revolutionaries famously rejecting the crown of Germany offered to him by the Frankfurt Parliament, calling it a crown from the gutter. The 1850s were subsequently a time of immense repression and conservative control in Prussia, as the king, beset by mental illness, retreated from public life and surrounded himself with ultra-conservative advisers. The Austrian Empire nearly collapsed entirely in 1848, being confronted with nationalist uprisings in Italy and Hungary, and a rebellion of the liberals and the poor in Vienna. The weak emperor, Ferdinand I, was most famous for the, quote, I am the emperor and I want dumplings. As the crowds approached the royal palace, he belatedly asked his ministers whether making revolution was allowed by law. It was only the intervention of a Russian army that crushed resistance and saved the Austrians in Hungary. Meanwhile, as we have seen, Habsburg armies just about held the line in Italy. In Vienna, Emperor Ferdinand was forced to resign, replaced by his nephew, Franz Josef, who would go on to rule for 68 years. The 1850s were, like in Prussia, a time of immense conservatism and reaction. The Habsburgs lost their Russian ally through a diplomatic blunder during the Crimean War, where at one stage they even threatened to declare war on the Russians if peace was not agreed upon. There was thus no one to support Austria when the French and Sardinians drove them out of Italy in 1859.
In Prussia, the new parliament was causing trouble by blocking military reforms. An army man himself, King Wilhelm of Prussia, considered it within his prerogative to increase the size of the military and the years of service. When the Liberal Parliament did not approve payment for these reforms, William Wilhelm sorry, refused to compromise with the Liberals and closed Parliament twice. Each time a new election was held, however, the Liberal majority increased. Desperate to break the deadlock, Wilhelm appointed Otto von Bismarck as Prime Minister. Bismarck was a scion from an old aristocratic family, yet at the same time was a man who understood the power of the middle class in the time that he lived. Moreover, years in Russia and France had given Bismarck a shrewd appreciation for power and diplomacy. He used a constitutional loophole that allowed him to pass the military reforms he needed without parliamentary consent. To earn support, he promised the Liberals foreign policy adventures, yet by 1864, opposition to continued to grow and the Chancellor needed a definite show of strength to prop up his command. Bismarck found his opportunity in Denmark. The Danes enjoyed a loose control over many German citizens in the historic duchies of Schleswig and Holstein, the later of which was part of the German Confederation itself. When the liberal German-speaking population in Schleswig opposed autocratic Danish rule and demanded a free constitution, the emerging Danish nationalist movement called for Schleswig to be incorporated into Denmark. When the nationalist government adopted this policy in 1848, the Germans of Schleswig and Holstein rose up, rose up with Prussia supplying military aid. Although the Danish army defeated the rebels in 1851, the great powers of Europe compelled Denmark to abandon its plans in Schleswig. In 1863, in the belief that Prussia was preoccupied with a Polish rebellion and in expectation of support from Sweden, the Danish government separated Holstein from the rest of the kingdom and annexed Schleswig. Prussia and Austria quickly teamed up, crushed the Danes, and divided Schleswig and Holstein between themselves. The stage was now set for the showdown between the old enemies of Prussia and Austria, which would finally decide the future of the German lands. In January 1866, the Prussians cooked up an excuse for war, and both sides began to mobilise their armies. Bismarck made sure to ally himself to the Italians, so as, not to so as to distract Austria in a two-sided conflict. Moreover, after Prussia invaded Austria's allies, Hanover and Saxony, in June 1866, it was clear that the extensive Prussian railway network gave the country an advantage over the slower to mobilise Austrians. Still, the Austrians held a numbers advantage when the two armies met at the Battle of Königgrätz in Bohemia. The Prussians nevertheless won the battle, largely thanks to the superior organisation and control of the battlefield of their senior officers, known as the General Staff. The Prussians also had a technology advantage, with their breech-loading rifles able to be loaded and fired whilst a soldier was crouching or lying flat, unlike the Austrian muskets, which needed to be slowly loaded while standing up. Königgrätz ended Austrian supremacy in Germany forever, and a compromise with the empire's Hungarian subjects led to the country becoming Austria-Hungary later that year. Prussia was victorious, and reorganised the North German states into the North German Confederation. All unification was not yet achieved, however. In 1871, French Emperor Napoleon III, who had set out the 1866 war as he mistakenly believed that the Habsburg forces would easily win, declared war on Prussia as a result of Bismarck proposing a Prussian candidate for the vacant Spanish throne. The German states, including the Catholic southern states such as Bavaria, rallied around Prussia. Britain, meanwhile, 
refused to help France after shocking documents came to light detailing France's aspiration for Belgium, a country in Britain's sphere of influence. Europe braced itself for a long war and a French victory. What came next, however, stunned interested observers. The Germans mobilised far quicker than France and concentrated their strength to achieve local supremacy in numbers, whilst the French dallied. The French had better rifles and machine guns, but this was offset by the Prussian supremacy in artillery, which obliterated French offences and positions. Then, the Prussian general staff deftly organised the movement of hundreds of thousands of troops over hundreds of miles of land, outflanking and encircling the cumbersome French, trapping them at Sedan and capturing the Emperor, who had once more joined his men. Following a siege of Paris, the new German Empire was proclaimed in the Palace of Versailles itself in January 1871. The new country of Germany would, in the following 40 years, rise to become Europe's premier economic and military power. Internally, it remained a decentralised federal system, with each state retaining extensive privileges. Some states, such as Bavaria, even retained their monarchy and were able to send envoys to foreign powers. There was a federal parliament, the Reichstag, which, thanks to voter suppression, was at first dominated by conservatives and the Junker landed no nobility, as well as nationalist liberals. Over time, social democrats would increase their numbers, but this lay far to the future. The military came out of the three wars of unification with extraordinary levels of prestige. It would exert a disproportionate influence over the German Empire, which would have the, an unfortunate impact for democracy in the country, given that the army remained the domain of the emperor and the high nobility. Following the ascension to the throne of Kaiser Wilhelm II, the navy too would be dominated by the emperor. Bismarck was happy with his new state and had no further designs for territorial expansion. In the 1870s, he therefore assumed the role of mediator in European conflicts, using German military might to help settle disputes, for example at the 1877 Congress of Berlin, perhaps his crowning diplomatic achievement, where a compromise was hashed out between the powers regarding the borders in the Balkans. Pushed into the decision by liberal merchants, however, Bismarck did expand the German colonial empire in Africa and in the Pacific Ocean, gobbling up today's Tanzania, Namibia and Cameroon, amongst other places. Increasingly, particularly after Bismarck's dismissal in 1890, the Germans would compete with the British in the colonial realm, aiming to become the world's premier power. A simultaneous economic and naval competition would do much to push Europe into war in 1914.